Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1163 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Federal Communications Commission's current bid to take over Amateur Spectrum is being challenged by the Data Network Group. We will have all the details. Following a falling out of sorts, separate Saturn nets are now operational on the HF bands. The IARU attended the International Telecommunications Union meetings on the interference potential of wireless power transfer. We will have all the details on that story. Germany is resuming in-person exam sessions. A new amateur radio digital communications grant will support hamnet expansion across Europe. The crossband repeater on board the International Space Station will remain operational beyond field day weekend. The International Amateur Radio Union continues its preparations for World Radio Communication Conference 2023. Repeaters and beacon stations in the Netherlands are going to be hit with a new annual fee. And NASA is testing open-air optical communication systems. We will have this story and a lot more is straight ahead in today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will discuss Microsoft's announcement of a new version of Windows. Meanwhile, Apple announces new hardware and updated releases of macOS and iOS systems. He will also discuss the recent Supreme Court decision overturning the 1986 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will try to answer every new ham's question. What radio should I buy as my first rig? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill lands in the middle of the CB craze in the mid-70s and looks at how it overwhelmed the FCC. And he also takes a look at the state of amateur radio in the year 1977. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will present the second part in his four-part series on writing a successful public service announcement about your club's upcoming ham fest or meeting and getting it on broadcast radio. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in sunny Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from our mobile news bureau, just outside Legoland in Goshen, New York, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting this week from the news desk here in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in the broadcast capital of the world, this is N2WWW in Schenectady, New York. And reporting from our Troy, New York news bureau, where the cottonwoods have dropped and the humidity has risen, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our amateur radio station high atop the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the corn is up about three inches now, the peas are up about six inches, and in fact the rest of the garden is growing like a weed. In fact, the weeds are growing like weeds. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where things may be getting rather soggy in the weather department this week, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Leading off this week's news, an FCC move that would take an amateur emergency network off part of the 5 gigahertz band is getting some pushback. The Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network has taken the next step in its challenge to an FCC order that would eliminate the network's access to the upper part of the 5 gigahertz band. The commission intends to allocate those frequencies instead for intelligent transportation systems and for unlicensed use such as Wi-Fi. 
On June 2nd, the network filed comments with the agency reaffirming radio operators' critical need to retain use of the band between 5.895 GHz and 5.925 GHz. The Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network's attorney filed the comments one month after submitting a petition asking the FCC to withdraw the order. The notice of proposed rulemaking dates to December 2019 when the FCC announced its intentions to reassign the band's upper 30 MHz. The Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network is a high-speed data network supplying public safety agencies with digital communication support through its email, text, and audio-video capabilities. It relays messages in emergencies such as forest fires and natural disasters and has also been used in public service events. Meanwhile, the FCC is also seeking comment on its proposal to give additional spectrum to private space launch companies on the amateur radio frequencies between 420 and 430 MHz and 5.65 to 5.925 GHz. Hams have a secondary allocation on these frequencies on the 70 cm and 5 cm bands, respectively. The 70 cm frequencies are widely used by hams for repeater links and amateur television and a portion of the 5 GHz spectrum is used by the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network. The Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network, or Saturn, launched a new Saturn International single sideband net on June 2nd on 14.325 MHz. With more details on the new Saturn net, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from ARRL Headquarters in Newington. Net sessions will take place Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 11 a.m. Central Daylight Time in cooperation with the Hurricane Watch Net, which has used 14.325 for many years during its own activations. Just down the band, another net sporting the same Saturn acronym, the Strategic Auxiliary Team Emergency Readiness Net, has established itself on Saturn's former frequency of 14.265 MHz. The latter net was organized by Lee Glassman, WA5LEE, a former manager of the original Saturn. The Salvation Army made the distinction clear in its announcement launching the new SSB net on 20 meters, calling the new Saturn a breakaway organization and not associated with the Salvation Army. The Saturn split will entail a new updated and revised Saturn website in the near future, the Salvation Army said in its announcement. The new Saturn under Glassman has already established its own web presence. On his QRZ.com profile, Glassman, an assistant emergency coordinator for South Texas District 14 Amateur Radio Emergency Service, cited a conflict of ideals. Glassman told ARRL that the NET retained the Saturn acronym because it was familiar to NET users, among other factors. He says there are no hard feelings on his part. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The Saturn split will entail a new updated and revised Saturn website in the near future, the Salvation Army said in its announcement. The new Saturn under Glassman has established its own web presence. Kiefer said that TSA Saturn will reestablish a web presence soon. Among other things, he said he was put off by a building list of requirements imposed by the Salvation Army that included credentialing and background checks. Glassman told ARRL that the NET retained the Saturn acronym because it was familiar to NET users, plus the fact that TSA pretty much decided to dissolve the daily 20-meter NET with no plans to replace it, and we did not wish the regulars to be kept hanging. We changed what the acronym stands for. We also have a pending trademark on the name and logo. Glassman said that if TSA had displayed any desire to continue the daily net, we would have gladly backed off and let it continue under TSA. He notes that Saturn began as an independent organization that was an adjunct to the Salvation Army. We do not disparage TSA, nor do we permit others to do so, Glassman said. We wholly encourage anyone to support TSA, ARES, ARC, and any other group that they wish. Glassman lists himself as co-manager of the Strategic Auxiliary Team Emergency Readiness Net, along with Ned Griffin, KL7QK. The NET says its purpose is to provide backup communication support during disasters for those in need. The original Saturn, the Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network, is a fully integrated Salvation Army program within the Salvation Army Emergency Disaster Services. It was organized in 1988 by Major Patrick McPherson, WW9E, now a silent key.
The Salvation Army said Saturn's mission is providing effective emergency communications via amateur radio and other communication modes to provide a wide scope of assistance to disaster survivors during a disaster operation. In carrying out its mission, Saturn recruits skilled volunteer radio amateurs who have been trained in disaster communications and other emergency disaster response practices, TSA said in its announcement. The International Amateur Radio Union, or IARU, represented the amateur service at a recent International Telecommunication Union recent virtual meeting on the topic of wireless power transmission attended by some 350 delegates. ITU Working Party 1A Working Group WG1A2 was of most relevance to IARU covering the topic of wireless power transmission. The focus is on WPT's impact on the radio spectrum. IARU contributions centered on proposing amendments to materials submitted by other delegations in a new annex that documents measurements of typical amateur signal levels, comparing these to test data from the U.S. on non-beam WPT emission levels and to suggested limits. Most of the discussions on the detail were resolved with a degree of compromise, and the latest drafts will be attached to the chairman's report for the meeting, IARU Region 1 reported. Remaining technical issues include whether E-field antennas are as susceptible to WPT electric vehicle emissions as H-field antennas, the true noise levels in residential areas with wireless power transmission developers claiming that WPT emissions will not be significantly above the now elevated noise level. In terms of the E-field sensitivity to wireless power transmission emissions, the proposed work plan submitted by IARU to the European Commission for WPT electric vehicle tests in the Joint Research Center include proper E and H field measurements. IARU Member Society DARC in Germany has made good progress with the rollout of its ENOMS automated noise measurement system and IARU is now able to draw heavily on that data, IARU Region 1 said. The WPT emissions document has been under discussion for some time. Here, there is no agreement yet on whether this should be a report or a recommendation and the work has been carried forward to the next meeting in November 2021. Discussion on so-called beam wireless power transmission covered a range of issues, including amendments to the proposed frequencies, none are below 800 megahertz. Sadly, many proposed frequencies fall in spectrum, which the amateur service shares with other services, IARU said. However, given the nature of the technology and the directivity of amateur antennas in these frequency ranges the prospect of coexistence seems quite good the international amateur radio union has provided extensive input on the potential impact on radio communications resulting from spurious emissions from wpt devices given the planned density of wpt systems for electric vehicles operating in the 79 through 90 kilohertz range Widespread interference could occur to amateur service stations in the vicinity of wireless power transmission systems. Japan's Sora News reports that amidst the number of closed businesses and beleaguered industries during the coronavirus pandemic, one particular hobby has made a surprise comeback. In general, of course, a pandemic is no good time for anyone or anything. From closed up factories to cultural traditions struggling to survive, COVID-19 has done its work. In Japan, COVID has even inspired a new and now commonly used phrase for the worldwide turmoil it's caused, koronaka, or literally in English, corona damage. But like all things in life, some silver linings have arisen from this situation, and this is especially the case for the amateur radio community. According to the Japan Amateur Radio League, the JARL, for the first time in 27 years, an increase in membership was recorded in 2020, with 578 new members, putting the total number of JARL participants at 65,788 individuals. While 578 new members doesn't sound like a monumental increase, it's still rather impressive, as, given the plethora of devices like smartphones and ever-rising internet usage, one would expect amateur radio's popularity to exponentially wane over the years. But JARL has seen a growth in interest. So, why are so many people in Japan pursuing amateur radio as their pandemic passion project? 
It seems to come down to two reasons, lack of human contact and the easing of government restrictions. With COVID-19 preventative policies imposing measures like social distancing, it's no surprise that some folks who are stuck at home are looking for new as well as safe hobbies which don't require going out or talking to other people face to face. Amateur radio is perfect for this because all you really need is the proper paperwork and a radio, which contrary to popular belief in Japan, isn't a dying art. Interestingly enough, another factor completely unrelated to COVID-19, which has given the amateur radio community a boost in its numbers, is a new regulation passed by the Japanese government in March 2021, essentially easing restrictions on who can operate a radio. In the past, you would have to be a licensed radio operator, but with the government's revisions, anyone can operate a radio station as long as they're working with or are supervised by an individual who is already certified as a radio operator. So regardless of an individual's personal background, it's definitely become more accessible to reach out over Japan's airwaves. You can read the full Sora News article at soranews24.com. In Australia, the Pride Radio Group is working to take the financial sting out of becoming a ham. The group is making free kits with basic equipment available to Pride members who qualify for the assistance and live in Australia. Pride is also providing tutorials on how to get started with the kits. The kits contain, in part, an FM DMR Handy Talkie, a Nova VNA with RF demo board, a hotspot, cables and adapters, along with several other basic essentials. Michaela Wheeler VK3FUR or VK4XSS, the group's founder, said this is one way to offset the high cost of starting an amateur radio in Australia, an effort that can carry a price tag of about 195 Australian dollars. Pride Radio Group, which was formed last year as a welcoming organization for amateur radio operators in the LGBTQ community, has shown a consistent growth of membership and now has a roster of 241. Germany is allowing in-person amateur radio examinations with a reduced number of candidates per exam session, while the heavy testing demand in Brazil is not being met, according to Brazil's National Amateur Radio Society. In Germany, regulators' examination sessions may resume for individual exam locations with fewer candidates each time. The regulator had canceled all amateur radio exam administration sessions and asked candidates not to register for testing. That changed at the start of June. The regulator said it's attempting to offer amateur exams again at all usual locations. The agency said test participants who have already been invited to an examination and whose examination had to be canceled will receive further information from us by post pending any further developments of the coronavirus pandemic. Finally, German regulators point out that all invitations to amateur radio exams are subject to the further development of the coronavirus pandemic. Unlike the U.S., Canada, and the U.K., Germany does not permit online exam sessions. Tests must be taken in person at a limited number of government exam centers. Brazilian telecommunications regulator Anatel met with representatives of Labri, the Brazilian counterpart to ARRL, in mid-May to discuss the conduct of that country's online exams. Anatel faces problems in meeting the great demand of people from all over the country who wish to become radio amateurs or progress in class, the agency said. Anatel said it has only a few examiners and cited technical limitations in the online test application platform, Microsoft Teams, preventing the agency from making further progress in meeting this demand. During the meeting, Labrie cited what it considers an even more serious problem with the current complexity and slow process involved in granting licenses. Labrie said this has not only frustrated candidates, but led some to simply give up on obtaining amateur radio operator and station licenses. Labrie said the process of getting licensed has been lengthy, extremely complex, and bureaucratic. Anatel proposed a joint effort to administer tests, and Labrie said it would assist in the incentive, including online testing. The agency also pointed out that standards governing amateur radio licensing in Brazil are undergoing revision. Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC, has awarded a grant to support European expansion of HamNet, a high-speed digital network that interconnects automated amateur radio stations using links in the 13, 6, and 3 centimeter bands, the Deutscher Amateur Radio Club, or DARC, reports. 
This marks the first international grant from ARDC since it began awarding grants in 2019. Amateur radio is a global hobby, and ARDC wanted to enable international funding from day one, ARDC President Phil Karn, KA9Q, said. One way to do this is to work with international organizations that meet IRS 501c3 requirements and are able to implement funding in their region. We're excited to see what the DARC will do and look forward to entering into similar partnerships with other organizations outside the United States. DARC Chair Christian Ensfelner, DL3 MBG, said DARC is very pleased that we can give the European Hamnet Project a big boost with this grant. DARC will present this project in more detail at the virtual Ham Radio World, being held this month on June 25th through the 27th. The Federal Communications Commission is inviting public comments on updating the Commercial Operator License Examination Question Pool for Element 7. That covers global maritime distress and safety system radio operating practices. A proposed updated Element 7 question pool of 600 questions has been submitted to the FCC by the National Global Maritime Distress and Safety System Task Force and has been posted under docket WT docket number 21-238 in the FCC electronic comment filing system. The FCC also invites suggestions for the new questions to be added to the Element 7 question pool. Comments are due by July 7th, 2021. Dayton Hamvention contesting related activities will move to the Hope Hotel in Dayton, Ohio in 2022. For many years, these activities took place at the Crown Plaza Hotel, now the Radisson Hotel. The schedule will include four nights of the Contest Super Suite, Contest University, Top Band Diner, Contest Diner, and the Kansas City DX Club CW Copy Competition. Hamvention, had it happened, would have lasted two to three days. You are now able to participate in two highlights of that weekend held virtually in May by spending a little more than eight hours on YouTube. Contest University held May 20th and many of the Hamvention forums held May 21st are now available on YouTube. They include the CQ Contest Hall of Fame presentation by John K1AR, Youth in Contesting presented by Philip DK6SP, Contesting from Russia by Willie, UA9BA. There is nothing magic about propagation by Jose, CT1BOH. And a memorial reading of the silent keys. The Russian organization, the Moscow Aviation Institute, known as MAI-75, will be conducting some experiments transmitting amateur radio slow-scan television images from the International Space Station during specific orbits that overfly Moscow on June the 9th and 10th this year. Amateurs along the ground track of these orbits should have the opportunity to receive these images as well. The SSTV images will be transmitted on 145.800 MHz using a Kenwood TM-D710 transceiver. The team are expecting to use the PD120 slow-scan television format. The published schedule says that there are two proposed periods of broadcasts, Wednesday the 9th of June between 0935 and 1350 UTC, and on Thursday the 10th of June between 0855 and 1550 UTC. Amateur radio on the International Space Station, known as ARIS, is a cooperative venture of international amateur radio societies and the space agencies that support the International Space Station. In the United States, for example, sponsors are the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, that's AMSAT, the American Radio Relay League, that's the ARRL, and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, better known as NASA. The primary goal of ARIS is to promote exploration of space, technology, engineering, the arts and mathematics by organising scheduled contacts via amateur radio between crew members aboard the space station and students on the ground. Before and during these radio contacts, students, educators, parents and communities learn about space, space technologies and amateur radio. For further information on the educational elements of the organization, please see www.aris.org. Images and information from the Russian experiment will be posted at www.spaceflightsoftware.com.
That's www.spaceflightsoftware.com. The Radio Society of Great Britain's Heather Parsons reports a great evening during the RSGB's Tonight at 8 webinar with Rob Sherwood, NC0B. He's the fellow who tests all the transceivers and reports his findings on his Sherwood Engineering website. As you might expect, his presentation was entitled Transceiver Performance for the HF, DX, and Contest Operator. Some 500 U.S. radio amateurs tuned in and viewers were able to post questions. Sherwood was asked what he thought of FT-8. I think it's good for the person who has a dipole in his attic. You can get on the air and have a good time with limited antennas. But the FT-8 is actually going crazy on six meters. That's about all you see anymore. And you can consider the FT-8 frequencies beacons, because if you want to know if the band's open, go to the FT-8 frequencies and you'll, you'll know whether the band's open or not. I can work Australia on 630 meters digital, which I couldn't ever do that on CW. Sherwood also explained the meaning behind the signal reports that FT-8 stations exchange. Those, he explained, really represent signal-to-noise ratio, and as a report is less negative or even positive. That just means it's the signal noise is getting better. So you should be able to decode a minus 10 any day of the week, for instance, but you probably can't decode a minus 22 any day of the week. So it's going to depend on your local noise. Like you could have somebody a mile away in a quieter location and he'll give a better report in effect because his noise might be lower than yours. Sherwood's presentation remains available on the RSGB's YouTube channel. The Irish Radio Transmitter Society Examination Board was in discussion during the week with the ERA regulator, Comreg, in relation to the holding of the next Herrick examination. IRTS informed Comreg that the list of candidates, now numbering over 100, along with appropriate details, will soon be forwarded to them in accordance with the terms of the contract. The timing of the examination, given that now there is an imminent and very favourable change in public health guidelines, was also discussed, and an outcome is expected very shortly. The Board is fully aware of its function and obligations, and has explored many possibilities to facilitate all those who have registered for the Herrick exam. The Board is required to be fully compliant with the terms and conditions laid out in the current contract issued by Comreg to IRTS to administer the Herrick exam. The issues and obstacles in preventing the Board from proceeding with the examinations has been reported to the President of IRTS, Mr Jim Hollihan, Echo India 4 Hotel Hotel, and discussed at committee, who on more than one occasion expressed their confidence in the Board. The Board, in turn, will be in a position very soon to inform candidates with details of dates and venues and would like to state that it is following the best practice for all concerned. Check out more at www.irts.ie. The International Space Station crossband FM repeater should remain active until after the field day weekend of June 26th and 27th. Amateur radio on the International Space Station, or ARIS, has decided to keep its ARIS interoperable radio system in cross-band repeater mode until after ARRL field day ends. The IORS ham station is located in the Columbus module of the International Space Station. ARRL HQ contest program manager Paul Baroque, N1SFE, has confirmed that successful radio contacts made through the ARIS IORS in cross-band repeater mode will count for an ARRL field day QSO point, but also for field day bonus points. Another fun opportunity for points. Don't forget the rule limiting stations to one QSO per any single channel FM satellite. On orbit, astronauts always have very busy schedules, but if a voice contact were to be made with them, it would count for QSO credit, but not for satellite bonus points. Only an ARIS crossband repeater QSO qualifies for the bonus. Crossband repeater contacts are also valid for AMSAT field day for satellite operations held concurrently with the ARRL event. Frequencies for ARIS crossband repeater operation are as follows. 145.990 MHz up with a 67 Hz tone and 437.800 MHz down. If you haven't used the ISS repeater yet, be sure to practice with it before field day, June 26th and 27th. These contacts can be tricky, 
but hams can practice right now. Eris had planned a mode switch to APRS packet during the second week of June. Now, Eris is targeting the switch by the astronauts to packet after the first Eris school contact following ARRL field day. In more news for Eris supporters, the astronauts will power down the Eris radio station during USA spacewalks on June 16th and June 20th. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Yeah, it's the tech show. Oh, honey, quick, change the channel. It's that tech show again. Yeah, I'm sorry. But right now, you're here. Let's see, what happened this week? Monday, June 7th, Apple's going to announce two new laptops. I'm pretty confident of that prediction. Don't know what else they'll do. iOS 15, Mac OS 12. But that's not the big story of the week. The big story of the week is uh, Microsoft has announced they're going to do a new version of Windows on June 24th. Well, what? We uh, haven't had a new version of a bit like a big numbered version of Windows since Windows 10 came out five years ago. At that time, Microsoft said this is the last version of Windows. I guess they were wrong. What does it mean when there's that there's going to be a new version? Nothing. <laughs> you could call it Windows 10 21 H2, I guess. I mean, it's not going to be it's not going to be that different. I don't think maybe we can we can dream. We can hope. What will they call it? Well, uh, indications are maybe Windows 11. The guy in charge of Windows, his name is Panos Panay. He's also in charge of hardware. Put out a tweet. Yeah, everybody, everything's announced by a tweet these days. Uh, saying, oh, here it comes. Join us June 24th, 11 a.m. Eastern time for the Microsoft event to see what's next. This came from the at Windows account. And then there's a picture of a window, Winder. In a, you know, just like the Windows window in a kind of in a blue room. But the sun shining through the window, there's a cross pane missing. So it makes a, an 11 on the floor. What? Windows 11. I think that's a, and it's starting at 11 a.m., which is not, you know, typical. Microsoft executive Yusuf Mehdi said he hasn't been, quote, this excited for a new version of Windows since Windows 95. Start me up, Yusuf. New version is is the key phrase, a new version of Windows. Next generation of Windows. Not Windows 10X. We'd heard about that. More likely what we'd heard about uh, as, as codenamed Sun Valley. Sun Valley. And the company's already called Sun Valley a, quote, sweeping visual rejuvenation of Windows. And so just to temper everybody's expectations, that's probably what we'll see June 24th is just a, a different look not even that different you can't change it too much uh interesting because businesses hate this you know they <laughs> they'd still be on windows xp in fact many are <laughs> if microsoft had to let them businesses don't like it when things change not one cotton pick and bit so i think it's likely that uh this isn't for business this is kind of for everybody else the home user we shall see they have been working on a new store I don't, does that get you excited? The new app store for Windows? It doesn't get me excited. Uh, rumors suggest, according to The Verge, it will be a significant departure from what exists today. Satya Nadella, their CEO, promised to, quote, unlock greater economic opportunity for developers and creators. Well, you know what that's all about. Apple's under great scrutiny. Not only are they being sued by the big game developer Epic, but uh, the EU and the, even the FTC and Congress are investigating them for their 30% App Store percent. You know, honestly, I think when Apple established the App Store in 2007, they started working on it in 2007 when the iPhone came out. They didn't release it until 2008. But when they started working on it, I think their thought was, well, if uh, I make software, I, put, I have to pay to print it on a 2007 CD, right, and put it in a box – and ship it to a store and put it on the store shelf. And then they take at least half. So if we create a store where we only take a third, 30%, and you don't have to worry about printing a CD or anything, we'll handle the downloads, everything like that. We'll make sure that customers flock to the store because 
and this is where they're in a little bit of trouble. Well, that will be the only way you can get stuff on the iPhone and the iPad. Oh, I don't see it as a problem. 30%. Most developers think that's eh, okay. Although one well-known developer, a guy who uh, worked at Tumblr for a while, he's very well-known in the Apple community. His name is Marco Arment. He's written some software. I mean, the, I guess his current thing is um, is a podcast client called Overcast. But he is he's a little miffed at Apple. He said Apple's leaders continue continue to deny developers of two obvious truths that our apps provide substantial value to iOS beyond the purchase commissions collected by Apple, that any portion of our customers came to our app from our own marketing reputation rather than the App Store. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I'm sure Apple understands the value that Angry Birds and uh, Fruit Ninja added to the iPhone. I'm sure they know that. That's why they're only taking 30%. I mean, I'm not here to develop, to, def to defend the App Store, but anyway, see how I managed to turn a Windows story into a Mac story? I'm, I'm, I'm clever that way, aren't I? Sorry about that. Didn't, didn't mean to hijack. <laughs> In any event, that's the, uh, that's the story. That's what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, I honestly, I, I'm not. I'm not I think what I think the best thing to do is temper your expectations for Windows 11. I remember when Windows 95 that was a big one. Remember they had tents and events and party and oh, I remember going to an event in Silicon Valley and it was boy it was a big deal. They had simulcasts of giant screens with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer and they were so excited about Windows 95. I remember when uh, XP came out big deal. In fact when Windows 7 came out they, uh, they invited people to send for a Windows 7 party pack so you could have a Windows 7 launch party in your own house. I sent for it. You got a deck of Windows 7 cards, a streamer, I think, a balloon, <laughs> cocktail napkin. So, micro, you know, it's a big deal. I mean, I think people get excited. Maybe Windows 7 was the last time we really got excited. Windows 10 was a good thing, but I don't know if I don't, did people jump up and down. Windows 8 was so horrible. People hated it so much that I think some people actually soured on Windows at that point. They were trying to jam a shoehorn a tablet operating system into a desktop operating system. Windows uh, 10 fixed all that, smoothed it out, and I think Windows 10 is very nice. There's some debate about whether it's as good as Windows 7, but I think most people agree that you know the great versions of Windows were Windows 2000, remember that one? Windows 7 and, uh, and Windows 10. And Windows 10, Microsoft said, this is the last one, this is it. We're going to just stick with this forever. So get it, and you won't ever have to pay for an upgrade. So now, they lied. Here's Windows 11. I don't... Will you have to pay for it? Unknown. That would be a bit of a sticky wicket. Uh, let's see. What else is uh, in the news? Some good news on Thursday, I, in my opinion anyway, from the Supreme Court. There is a uh, Computer Fraud Act. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act from 1986. So you can tell it's kind of it's so old, it's probably a little out of date. CFAA, they call it. Which has been used, honestly, to go after people for things that I wouldn't call hacking or fraud. Abuse, maybe. I don't know. For instance, there was one very well-known case. Uh, one of the most important young guys on the... Uh, on the internet, who was who had invented some very important things like uh, RSS, without which podcasts would not exist, and so forth. Aaron Schwartz was being prosecuted for what I would say was probably not computer abuse or fraud, but or hacking, but merely kind of um, civil disobedience. He was downloading uh, scientific articles, articles, studies that we had paid for as the taxpayers, but were were behind a paywall. He was downloading them because he had access to that database to uh, make them public, as they should be. And uh, the uh, feds came after him, and he faced perhaps decades behind bars and uh, and killed himself as a result at the age of 26. A very sad, huge loss to the community, huge loss. And, uh, you know, he's become a folk hero. And that was under the CFAA. He was, he was being investigated. A little less <laughs> sanguine about the case that the Supreme Court decided on Van Buren involved a former police officer. He was uh, convicted of violating the CFAA because uh, the FBI, as a part of a sting operation, came to him as you know, as a you know, undercover 
saying, hey, could you search the license plate database for us? Now, the, the officer had access to it legitimately, and he did it, you know, and, and he was convicted of, uh, of violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for searching that license plate database in exchange for a bribe. He appealed the conviction saying, hey, the CFAA, that, all this, this was unauthorized use of a system I'm authorized to use as part of my job, and the Supreme Court agreed and overturned that conviction. Maybe the, you know, maybe this will focus on the bribe part. I don't know. But I'm really glad that they overturned this. On the other hand, some people aren't. The National Whistleblower Center uh, warned, actually, no, they were among the many briefs in in favor of overturning it. They, they wrote a brief, an amicus brief, as they call it, a friend of the court brief to the Supreme Court, saying, if you apply the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to any unauthorized use of computer data, as was the case with this officer and with Aaron Schwartz, uh, that would invite retaliation against whistleblowers, right? Because they could say, well, you know, he was looking at stuff he shouldn't have been looking at. The uh, Libertarian Americans for Prosperity Foundation. I'm for prosperity. Who isn't? Go prosperity. They said the government's interpretation of the law would cover violations of the fine print in websites' terms of service. Yeah, that's that's true. And wrongly criminalize a wide swath of innocent, innocuous conduct. That, yeah, that's true. So this is good. The Supreme Court very much narrowed how this can be used by federal law enforcement. I think that's a good thing. So that's my opinion. Anyway, anyway I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. And I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Backlogged, paralyzed, swamped, and overwhelmed. These are the words that describe the FCC in January 1977. The reason? Citizens banned radio applications. The CB craze had started in 1974 with the first gas crisis. Fueled by top 10 songs, TV shows, and movies, CB radio became an incredibly popular fad among the public in the days before computers, the internet, cable TV, or cellular phones. Prior to the gas crisis, the licensed CB population had stabilized at about 800,000. Now, over 500,000 applications per month poured into the FCC Gettysburg office. The peak was reached in January when 1 million applications came in. By the end of 1977, over 10 million CB licenses had been issued. The explosive growth in 11-meter activity, coupled with the unresolved Class E CB issue, caused increased friction between CBers and hams. The ARRL was still fighting the proposed reallocation of 2 MHz in our 220 band to Class E. Instead, the League suggested a new CB band at 900 megahertz. Then, on April 4, 1977, the Class E fight was thrust into the public spotlight. Jack Anderson, in his nationally syndicated column, charged that the FCC was staffed by Ham Henchman, who conspired with the 300,000 amateurs to keep 9 million CBers from getting expanded frequencies. The ARRL, along with dozens of hams, sent rebuttals to the media. The friction gradually subsided when the FCC announced the 27 MHz CB band would be expanded from 23 to 40 channels. The Class E question was settled on October 13, 1977, when the FCC dropped the idea. Our 220 band was safe for now. Ironically, the United States lost $200 million on the CB boom. How? Well, late in 1976, a federal court overturned the FCC's license fee structure. Rather than appeal the decision and or overhaul their fee assessment procedure, the FCC suspended collection of all license fees effective January 1, 1977. A Class D CB license cost $20. You can do the math. Incidentally, amateurs benefited from the license fee suspension. A new or renewed license, except for the novice, used to cost $9. Now it was free. Amateur radio was growing in 1977. 
At the beginning of the year, there were 293,655 hams. By mid-year, the number was 313,000, and on December 1st, it was 327,000. This was a healthy 11% growth in one year and a 25% increase over the 1974 census. The biggest single reason was probably 2-meter FM. Hundreds of repeaters with the distinctive WR prefix covered the country coast to coast. The pages of QST were filled with ads for crystal control 2-meter FM rigs, such as the Midland 13500 and 13505, the Wilson 1402 and 1405, the Regency HR2B and HR312, the Geneve GTX1 and GTX10, and the Heathkit HW202. With crystals for 12-channel operation, these units cost about $250. Counting inflation, that's about $700 today. For the 1977 operator who wanted the latest in synthesized technology, Clegg had the FMDX for $599, or $1,500 today, and Heathkit introduced the HW2036, which covered the 146 through 148 MHz FM segment of the 2-meter band. For those on a tight budget, VHF Engineering had a 1-watt 2-meter transmitter kit for $29.95, a 2-meter receiver kit for $69.95, and a 2-watt, 4-channel, 2-meter HT kit for $129.95. Technicians now had novice privileges but were still banned from 50.0 to 50.1 and 144 through 145 MHz. However, the 2-meter repeater segment at 146 through 148 MHz was becoming crowded. In response to several petitions, on November 4, 1977, the FCC opened a new repeater subband from 144.5 through 145.5 MHz. In addition, they deleted the separate station license requirement for repeaters. Any amateur, except for novice, could now put up a repeater without prior FCC approval. Logging requirements for repeaters were simplified. Finally, Technicians were given full access to the new repeater subband, although the 144.0 through 144.5 segment was still out of bounds for technicians. In other FCC news for 1977, on March 1st, instant upgrading appeared. Licensed amateurs could immediately use new privileges upon passing the test for a higher class license, rather than waiting six to eight weeks for the overloaded FCC to send the new license. On July 1st, any extra class amateur could apply for a one by two call. Due to a 500% increase in amateur exams, as well as a massive workload, the FCC announced on August 18th that the CW sending test would be eliminated for all licenses above novice. However, the FCC had only one proposal that brought forth the wrath of the amateur community. Citing illegal CB operation on the 10.5 meter band, in other words, those frequencies between 27.405 and 28 MHz, the FCC wanted to ban commercial amplifiers capable of operation between 24 and 35 MHz and to require type acceptance on any amplifier that operated below 144 MHz. Except for novice VXOs in the early 1970s, the FCC had never required type acceptance on any amateur transmitter. The amateur community strongly opposed this proposal. Hams were being punished for the crimes of others. The FCC promised an answer by 1978. In summary, 1977 was a good year for amateurs, but there were still some unfinished business. Would technicians get the full two-meter band and, along with generals, regain the 50.0 through 50.1 MHz segment they lost under incentive licensing? Would CB radio continue its massive growth and make more demands on amateur frequencies? Finally, would the FCC ban 10-meter amplifiers? The answers lie in 1978. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for This Week in Amateur Radio. 
Even as the pandemic was forcing people into isolation last year, one of the newest amateur radio clubs in the UK was making plans to bring radio operators together, at least in spirit, if not in person. Paul, M0XZT, and Andy, 2E0GGX, started up the East Ardsley Radio Society, G3EAR, to fill a need for local hams wanting to be together. Now the newly created club, known informally as EARS, is preparing for its first in-person meeting on the 25th of June at the East Ardsley Cricket Club. The painting and redecorating have already been done and, as Paul reported that, we are ready to open for our first proper club meeting. If government restrictions are not lifted by that time, Paul said, the hams will meet outside the club shack instead for a bit of socializing. That's likely to be a lot easier than the Facebook Messenger chat they've been using all this time. Paul and Andy hope to be joined by fellow founder Bob, 2E0RMW, David, G1NYN, Mark, 2E0VTN, Darren, 2E0VBL, and Mick, M6MWP. Paul also said that the long-term goal is to cater to local hams at all levels of experience and open their doors to anyone wanting to try for a contact on the low bands, DMR, D-Star, Fusion, or someone perhaps wanting to learn Morse code. Foundations of Amateur Radio Recently, a budding new amateur asked the question, what radio should I buy? It's a common question, one I asked a decade ago. Over the years, I've made several attempts at answering this innocent introduction into our community, and as I've said before, the answer is simple, but unhelpful. It depends. Rather than explaining the various things it depends on, I'm going to attempt a different approach, and in no particular order, ask you some things to consider and answer for yourself in your journey towards an answer that is tailored specifically to your situation. What's your budget? How much money you have set aside for this experiment is a great start. In addition to training and license costs, you'll need to consider things like shipping, import duties and insurance, power leads and a power supply, coax leads and connectors, and last but not least, adapters, antennas and accessories. Should you buy second-hand or pre-loved? If you have electronics experience that you can use to fix a problem with your new-to-you toy, this is absolutely an option. When you're looking around, check the provenance associated with the equipment, and avoid something randomly offered online with sketchy photos and limited information. Equipment is expensive. Check for stolen gear and unscrupulous sellers. What do you want to do? This hobby is vast. You can experiment with activities, locations, modes and propagation, to name a few. If you're looking at a specific project, consider the needs for the accompanying equipment, like a computer, if what you want to explore requires that. You can look for the annual amateur radio survey by Dustin, November 8 Romeo Mike Alpha, to read what others are doing. What frequencies do you want to play on? If you have lots of outdoor space, you'll have many options to build antennas from anything that radiates, but if you're subject to restrictions because of where you live, you'll need to take those into account. You can also operate portable in a car or on a hill, so you have plenty of options to get away from needing a station at home. Are there other amateurs around you? If you're within line of sight of other amateurs or a local repeater, then you should consider if you can start there. If that doesn't work, consider using HF or Explore Space Communications. There are online tools to discover repeaters and local amateurs. Is there a club you can connect to? Amateur radio clubs are scattered far and wide across the planet, and it's likely there's one not too far from you. That said, there are plenty of clubs that interact with their members remotely. Some even offer remote access to the club radio shack using the internet. Have you looked for communities to connect with? There is plenty of amateur activity across the spectrum of social media, dedicated sites, discussion groups, email lists, and chat groups. You can listen to podcasts, watch videos, read ebooks, and if all that fails, your local library will have books about the fundamental aspects of our hobby. Have you considered what you can do before spending money? Figuring out the answers to many of these questions requires that you are somewhat familiar with your own needs. You need a radio to become an amateur, but you need to be an amateur to choose a radio. To get started, you don't need a radio. If you already have a license, you can use tools like Echolink with a computer or a mobile phone. 
If you don't yet have a license, you can listen to online services like WebSDR, KiwiSDR and plenty of others. You can start receiving using a cheap RTL SDR dongle and some wire. Which brand should you get? Rob, November Charlie, Zero Bravo, has been testing radios for longer than I've been an amateur. His Sherwood testing table contains test results for 151 devices. The top three, ICOM, Kenwood and Yesu, count for more than half of those results. This means that you'll likely find more information, more support and more local familiarity with those three. I will point out that Rob's list has 27 different brands on it, so look around and read reviews both by people who test the gear and those who use it. And finally, why are you here? It's a serious question. Different things draw different people into this community. Think about what you like about it and what you want to do more of. Take those things into consideration when you select your radio. As you explore the answers to these questions, you'll start building a picture of what amateur radio means to you, and with that will come the answer to the question, what radio should I buy as my first one? If there are other questions you'd like to ask, don't hesitate to get in touch. My address is cq at vk6flab.com. I look forward to hearing from you. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Spectrum Affairs Chair Barry Lewis, G1SJH, reports that efforts continue in defending the interests of amateur radio during preparations by CEPT, the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administrations, for World Radio Communication Conference 2023. The International Telecommunication Union sponsors the World Radio Communication Conference. Meeting on May 21st, the IARU worked with CEPT regional telecommunications organizations at the third meeting of the conference preparatory group. The CPG is the parent group in CEPT that oversees the development of the CEPT briefs for each World Radio Communication Conference 2023 agenda item and reviews the progress of individual project teams under the conference preparatory group umbrella. International Amateur Radio Union Regions put forward the agreed preliminary IARU positions for agenda items that could affect amateur radio. IARU's overall objective is to safeguard the allocations to the amateur and amateur satellite services in the co and adjacent frequency bands with the scope of each agenda item. CEPT briefs include a specific section in which the views of all the recognized international and regional organizations can be placed, and IARU's views are now in this section of the draft briefs for each agenda item of interest. The meeting also heard presentations from other Region 1 RTOs as well as organizations from Region 2 and Region 3 about their preparations. These presentations and the CEPT meeting document drafts are available via the CEPT website. The IARU Spectrum and Regulatory Liaison Committee continues to be active in all the CEPT project teams dealing with the World Radio Communication Conference preparation. The Federal Communications Commission is seeking comment on the impact of the continuing global shortage of semiconductors. The FCC's May 11th public notice stated its concern is focused on the impact of the shortage would have on the communications industry, agency initiatives, and the nation's continued advancement in the next generation technologies. FCC Acting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel commented, the communications sector is one of the fastest growing segments of the semiconductor industry. These tiny pieces of technology are the basic building blocks of modern communications, including 5G, Wi-Fi, satellites, and more. And that is why we are seeking to better understand the current shortage, its consequences for communications sector, and steps we can take to ensure the FCC priorities and initiatives remain on track. Interested parties may file comments online using the FCC's electronic comment filing system. Initial comments are due on June 10th, and reply comments, which are comments on the previous filed comments, are due on June 25th. 
The Graphene Manufacturing Group in Brisbane, Australia, together with the University of Queensland, have developed a graphene aluminium iron battery energy storage technology that has up to three times the capacity of a lithium iron battery and can charge up to 60 times faster. The battery was created by inserting aluminium atoms into perforations made in graphene planes. The company claims that because the batteries don't have an upper current limit that would otherwise cause spontaneous overheating, the batteries are also safer. The stable base materials also facilitate their recycling later. The company hopes to bring these cells to the market by the end of 2021 or early 2022. And you can find out more by visiting graphenemg.com. Time now for the AMSAT report. As reported earlier in this edition, the ARIS team will have the cross-band repeater on the ISS turned on for field day. See field day rule 7.3.7. AO91 will be on for field day, but AMSAT stresses do not use it when the satellite is in eclipse. It will damage the satellite. The command team pondered turning AO91 off for field day. However, there is a possibility that it will not turn on when commanded. The thinking is that it's best to leave it on and hope users will comply with the request not to use it during eclipse. For a complete list of available satellites and frequencies, visit amsat.org. Click on Satellite Info, then click on Communication Satellites. There's even a link for past prediction in the event you do not have tracking software. Enjoy Field Day and give the satellites a try. The AMSAT report comes to us each week via Bruce Page, KK5DO. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspot activity has shown steady but modest increases over the past three weeks, with the average daily sunspot weekly averages rising from 24.9 to 28 to 34.9. Oddly, Average daily solar flux for the same three weeks was 77.8, 77.8, and 77.7, remarkably unchanged week after week. The average daily planetary A index went from 6.1 last week to 5.9 in this week's report, and the middle latitude A index went from 6.3 to 6.9. So let's take a look at the predicted solar flux over the next few weeks, and that will be 75 on June 12th through the 20th, 80 on June 13th through the 17th, 75, then 80, 82, and 77 on June 21st through the 23rd, 76 on June 24th all the way to July 5th, 74, 74, and 75 on July 6th through the 8th. And finally, looking at the predicted planetary A index, that will be 5 on June 12th and 13th, 8 on June 14th and 15th, 20 and 18 on June 16th and 17th, 5 on June 18th and staying there all the way through the 25th, 7 on June 26th, 5 on June 27th all the way to July 4th, 15, 10, and 8 on July 5th through the 7th, and 5 on July 8th through the 12th. John Echo India 7 Golf Lima on his blogspot at ei7gl.blogspot.com reports that there was a remarkable opening on the 3rd of June from the Azores in the North Atlantic to Europe, where Charlie Uniform 1 Alpha Alpha, Charlie Uniform 1 Alpha Lima, and Charlie Uniform 3 Echo Quebec all worked paths in excess of 3,000 kilometers into Germany. As reported by stations on the DX cluster, the primary propagation mode was sporadic E. However, as the maximum range for one hop is in the region of 2,300 kilometers, something else had to make up the additional 700 or so kilometers. There are two possibilities. One was chordal hop sporadic E with an intermediate bounce going from sporadic E to sporadic E cloud, this would, however, require two intense areas of sporadic E at just the right spot to support 144 MHz propagation. So the more likely scenario was that it was a single sporadic E cloud with a tropo extension. The weather charts show high pressure over the Azores, which supports this suggestion.
EI7GL also reports on excellent conditions on 50 MHz on June the 3rd, when an FT8 contact was made over a 14,966 km path between Kilo Golf 6 Delta X-Ray on the island of Guam in the Pacific and Echo Alpha 8 Delta Bravo Mike on the island of Tenerife in the Canary Islands. On June the 2nd, also on 50 MHz, John reports that the longest path worked was between the aforementioned EA-8 DBM on Tenerife and Victor Kilo 4 Alpha Bravo Whiskey in Darwin on the north coast of Australia. Well, that path works out at around 16,220 km, also using mode FT8. Well, there's no doubt the VHFDXs in Southern Ireland had a ball during the past week. NASA has selected LightCube, along with 13 other small research satellites, to fly as auxiliary payloads aboard rockets launching between 2022 and 2025. With more details on this unique satellite, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report on LightCube from League Headquarters in Newington. Being designed, built, and tested by an interdisciplinary team of students, advisors, and engineers across multiple organizations, LightCube is a microsatellite educational mission that aims to produce a light visible to the naked eye to observers on Earth. The spacecraft's two xenon flash tubes will be triggered via amateur radio. When the light beacon is activated, the one-unit CubeSat will be visible momentarily. Each flash will take eight microseconds, with a brightness similar to that of the International Space Station. Following deployment from the ISS, LightCube will orbit Earth for approximately two years. The LightCube mission is a collaborative project between Arizona State University and other entities ASU designed and built the satellite. Here's how it works. A radio amateur with a handheld transceiver will wait until the satellite is roughly overhead. The user then will transmit a predefined number code and if LightCube is charged, it will flash. The satellite then requires 30 seconds to recharge the capacitor that fires the xenon light tubes. Details to come. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The launch opportunity is provided through NASA's CubeSat launch initiative. At this point, no frequencies have been coordinated for LightCube. The idea itself is not novel. As the LightCube sponsors note, FitSat in 2013 used high-power LEDs to transmit Morse code. Equisat in 2016 could produce a beacon visible to the naked eye. WSJTX version 2.4.0 now is available in general release. Here with more details on the new release, which includes a new digital mode, is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. As we reported last week, WSJTX version 2.4.0 is now available in general release. It includes the new digital mode Q65. That protocol is designed for two-way contacts over especially difficult propagation paths. According to the Quick Start Guide, on paths with Doppler spread more than a few hertz, the weak signal performance of Q65 is the best among all WSJTX modes." End quote. WSJTX version 2.5.0 RC1, that's a beta version, now has been released. The release notes say that in 2.5.0, the Q65 decoder has been enhanced to measure and compensate for linear frequency drift in Q65 signals. Q65 uses 65-tone frequency shift keying and offers user message and sequencing identical to that in FST4, FT4, FT8, and MSK144. It includes a unique tone for time and frequency synchronization. Q65 isn't likely to find much use on the HF bands, but on 6 meters, where FT8 has gained a huge following, it could be a game changer for some stations. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. As with JT65, the Q65 sync tone is readily visible on the waterfall spectral display. In addition, Q65 provides a sensitive sync curve near the bottom of the waterfall window. 
Testing showed that Q65 will enable stations with a modest Yagi and 100 watts or more to work one another on 6 meters at distances up to 2,000 kilometers on most days of the year in dead band conditions. An excellent example of targeted uses of Q65 is ionospheric scatter on the 6 meter band, the document states. Extensive tests on the 1,150 kilometer path between K1JT and K9AN have shown that with 300 watts power output, nearly every Q65 30 alpha transmission is copied correctly by the other station. The 30 alpha refers to the transmit receive period and spacing width. For the complete announcement, and to download the latest version, visit the WSJTX website. The Netherlands International Amateur Radio Union Member Society, Veron, says an additional charge of 79 euros, about 96 US dollars a year, being levied on amateur radio repeaters and beacons is detrimental to experimental radio research. Regulator Agenshop Telecom said the higher rate is tied to additional costs specifically for investigation and surveillance for illegal users at relay stations. Veron has requested cancellation of the new fee. Elsewhere, a new 8-meter propagation beacon, call sign EI1CAH, is now on the air from the west of Ireland on 40.016 MHz. The new beacon will transmit in both CW and PI4 mode with an output power of 25 watts into a horizontal dipole. According to the announcement, the new 40 MHz beacon is designed to explore the possibility of VHF paths across the Atlantic and it may prove a useful propagation for 50 MHz operators in North America looking for openings to Europe. The beacon has the potential to be heard in the Americas and the Caribbean. Visit EI7GL's blog for more information. Licensing issues have caused another postponement for the EASAT-2 and Haiti satellites. With more details on the new satellites, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. The two amateur radio satellites built by AMSAT EA in Spain are planned to be carried aloft by a SpaceX launch vehicle. Spain's IARU member society URE said the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA in the U.S., has rejected issuing a license to the integrator Momentus. The FAA denial stems from the company's capital structure, which it says could endanger U.S. national security. The next launch opportunity won't come until December. ESAT and Hades were set to launch in January aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, but the FAA rejected the momentous license at that time as well. Hades and ESAT are currently at the momentous space integrator facilities in Santa Clara, California. Both satellites are FM and FSK voice repeaters and have digitized voice recordings. Hades also will incorporate slow scan TV developed by the British University of Technology in the Czech Republic. Frequencies have been coordinated for both satellites. BA is an experimental payload. EASAT-2 incorporates a ballistic material from Lanzarite, similar to lunar base halts, provided by the Research Group on Meteorites and Planetary Geosciences of the Spanish Research Council in the Institute of Geosciences. It's thought the material could be used as a construction material on the moon. Meanwhile, Spain's IARU member society, URE, has announced that its satellite's ground station has been automated and is ready for the launch of the Genesis, EASAT-2, and Haiti satellites. The Satellite Monitoring and Telecommand Station is located at URE's Madrid headquarters. Work on the project began before the COVID-19 pandemic and included installation of a Linux computer, configuration of software-defined radio receive software, transmitting software, and Pluto hardware, along with automation of the rotator control. The station will automatically record and analyze the telemetry of the twin Genesis satellites as well as that of EASAT-2 in Hades, all designed and built by AMSAT-EA. It allows for remote control to instruct satellites to modify operation. The Genesis satellites should be launched soon. Help Canada celebrate its birthday on the air during the Radio Amateurs of Canada Canada Day Contest on Thursday, July 1st, 
just a few days ahead of Independence Day in the U.S. Canada Day is the anniversary of Canada's Confederation, when the three colonies of Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick united into the Dominion of Canada on July 1, 1867. The RAC Contest Committee is asking all participants in the 2021 Canada Day Contest to follow guidelines provided by the government and by health officials in their respective areas for any multi-operator categories. The Canada Day Contest begins on July 1st at 0000 UTC, which is the evening of Wednesday, June 30th, in North American time zones, and continues through 2359 UTC. Bands include 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, 6, and 2 meters, CW and SSB, FM, AM, and digital modes. Stations in Canada send signal reports plus province or territory. VE zeros and stations outside Canada send a signal report and a serial number. Stations may be worked once on each mode on each of the available bands. Canada's 10 provinces and three territories serve as multipliers for the event. Having long since traded their military careers for roles as public museums, an international array of battleships, aircraft carriers, minesweepers, destroyers, and cargo ships was determined to have fun in spite of challenging conditions. That's just what they did for 48 hours on June 5th and 6th. The annual Museum Ships Weekend got on the air with hams calling QRZ from the Netherlands to Australia, all the way to Camden, New Jersey, home of the Battleship New Jersey Amateur Radio Station, the event sponsors. Although pandemic precautions reduced the number of participating ships to 81, radio operators were busy nonetheless. Harry Bryant, AA2WN, the club president, said preliminary results showed on the New Jersey ship alone the nine operators operating two at a time logged 554 HF contacts from 10 countries and 38 states. Using one of the ship's satellite antennas as an enclosure for a 2-meter and 440 antenna array, the operators also were able to make contacts on VHF for the first time. Harry said that band conditions were less than optimal for this year's event, but the hams made the best of 40, 30, and 20 meters operating as NJ2BB. Harry said that despite the pandemic and propagation, we still had a fun and satisfying event. We are ever hopeful that normalcy will prevail next year with many more ships, operating hours, operators, and better band conditions. These ships, after all, have seen greater challenges. The Yasmi Foundation is a non-profit corporation organized to conduct scientific and educational projects related to amateur radio, including DXing, that's long distance communication, and the introduction and promotion of amateur radio in underdeveloped countries. It's based in the American state of California. The foundation was established in 1960 and named after the legendary yacht Yasmi, the boat that carried Danny Weil on the expeditions to many remote places from which he operated amateur radio, sometimes activating the location for the very first time. IARU Region 2 reports that the Yasmi Foundation has donated 12 462 MHz family radio service handhelds to help train new radio amateurs in the country of Peru. Radio Club Peruano is committed to promoting amateur radio in Peru. Supported by the new regulations for the amateur radio service enacted by the Peruvian administration in July 2019, the club has held three virtual courses to prepare candidates to obtain an open access license. One of the limitations that the Peruvian club has always faced is the capacity to motivate youngsters and children to venture into the hobby in a practical manner that complements the courses. The use of transmitting equipment in radio amateur bands for unlicensed individuals is forbidden in the country. Therefore, the Yasmi Foundation, through its president, Ward Silver, November Zero Oscar Alpha X-Ray, agreed to donate 12 family radio service portable radios to the club to be used in the training programs, which Radio Club Peruano hopes will begin shortly once the distancing limitations imposed during the pandemic are solved. The family radio service allocation features 22 channels between 462 and 467 megahertz and operators do not require a license. 
For more information about the Radio Club Peruano's program for young people and children, you're welcome to contact Oscar Pansolvo, Oscar Alpha 4, Alpha Mike November, and Pablo Vasquez, Oscar Alpha 4, Alpha India. Their contact details can be found at qrz.com. And more about the Yasmi Foundation can be seen at www.yasmi.org. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. Visit the Learning Network webpage to register, check on upcoming webinars, or to view previously recorded sessions. Improving Your Club's 2021 Field Day Score, hosted by Paul Bork, N1 SFE, ARRL Contest Program Manager, will be held on Thursday, June 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern, that's 0 UTC on Friday, June 11th. Learn how your club or group can take advantage of the 2021 ARRL Field Day Rules Waivers while operating as Class D or E from home. We'll discuss how individuals or groups can boost their scores by earning bonus points, review how to use the Field Day web applet to submit your score, and go over how to attribute your score to your club's aggregate score. This presentation highlights all you need to know to operate as a group for ARRL Field Day 2021. Antenna Zoning Special six-part webinar series presented by Fred Happengarten, K1 VR author of Antenna Zoning for the Radio Amateur. Part 1, Permitting in a Nutshell, will be held on Monday, June 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern, that's 1800 UTC. Part 2, Principles and Preparation, How to Wear the White Hat, will be held on Wednesday, June 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. Part 3, The Application, will be held on Monday, June 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. Part 4, PRB1, A Deep Dive, will be held on Wednesday, June 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern, that's 1800 UTC. Part 5, More Laws, will be held on Monday, June 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. Part 6, The Hearing, will be held on Wednesday, June 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern, that's 1800 UTC. Introduction to Remote HF Operation, hosted by David Lemfranconi, W6DGE, and Kevin Schinwheeler, N7KSW, from the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club, will be presented on Tuesday, June 22nd, at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Then Franconi and Shin Wheeler will discuss the idea, process, and challenges encountered while getting their club's remote HF station on the air, as well as some methods and resources available for those with a similar interest. A question and answer session and live demo are included. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. Visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar webpage for the latest webinar details. Many on the campus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and beyond are mourning the death of Professor Emeritus and radio astronomer pioneer Gordon Pettengill, W1OUN. He had been director of the then-new Arcebo Observatory in Puerto Rico before stepping down in 1970. At MIT, he became a professor of planetary physics and director of the MIT Center for Space Research. Gordon's work also involved reproposing military radar technology for science and space exploration. At MIT, he also used the Lincoln Laboratory Millstone Hill radar to create the first two-dimensional radar map of the moon. The map was a critical component used by NASA in its plans for the Apollo moon landing that were to come later. Gordon was an avid ham radio operator throughout his life, starting with his high school years. Gordon was a World War II veteran, and after the war ended, he continued his involvement in communications through his assignment to the U.S. Army Signal Corps, stationed in Austria. He passed this past May at the age of 95 of congestive heart failure. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In this series, we are looking into free promotion for your ham radio club's not-for-profit fundraiser, specifically the public service announcement 
or PSA as they are more commonly called. The first step after obtaining all pertinent information, answering all the who, what, why, where, and when questions, is to write a rough draft of a simple 30-second script or roughly two short paragraphs. A sample PSA for a ham fest could read something like this. The Bowen County Amateur Radio Club is hosting their third annual Hamfest Flea Market and Computer Swap Meet on Saturday, October 28th at 7 a.m. at the Bowen County Fairgrounds on Fairway Road, two miles east of State Road 9 in Bowen County. Gates open at 7 a.m. Parking is free. Admission is $5 per person. Senior citizens and children under 18 get in for free. The Swap Meet closes at 4 p.m. Come join the fun. Buy, sell, or trade your electronic stuff, too. The public is always welcome to attend. Stop in and find out more about amateur radio, sky-worn weather spotting, emergency preparedness, ham radio license testing, and free classes. That's Saturday, October 28th, 7 a.m. at the Bowen County Fairgrounds. See you at the Ham Fest. Well, in this sample PSA, we covered all the basic questions and wrote it to appeal to the non-ham but curious. We repeated the most important information of where and when. When we plan an event like a small ham fest, it is a given that most of the attendees are hams. But the biggest reward we reap is new club members and mostly from new hams. So write your PSA to appeal to the non-ham but curious. In this segment, we covered the basic elements of a proper PSA script. We kept it to two short paragraphs, provided all the information, and repeated the date, time, and location. Next time, we'll cover putting this information into a broadcaster-friendly format and getting it ready for sticking in the mail. This is Greg Stoddard, Kilo Fox, Nine Mike Papa, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, welcome to the age of optical communications. This week, NASA is launching the Laser Communications Relay Demonstration, or LCRD, as a payload on a U.S. satellite in geosynchronous orbit some 22,000 miles from Earth. This demonstration will test higher bandwidth transfer using optical communications, which may supplement traditional data transfer using radio. The infrared light used for laser communications differs from radio waves because the laser packs the data into significantly tighter waves, increasing the data throughput 10 to 100 times more than that of radio frequency systems. Laser communication systems are also smaller and weigh less. The LCRD is expected to use a data rate of 1.2 gigabits per second in its communications with ground stations in California and Hawaii. NASA has said on its website that radio technology's limits are being challenged by newer technologies. At this data rate, one could download a two-hour movie in about 20 seconds. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry this week in amateur radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week.
This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.